Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another digital discussion from the John Quincy Adams Society. My name is Julie Thompson Gomez. I'm a program manager here at JQAS, and I'm filling in for John Gay. Uh, tonight, we're speaking with Dr. Jason Castillo, who's an associate professor and the Evelyn and Ed F. Cruz, a class of 49 faculty fellow in the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. He's also the co-director of the Albert and Center for Grand Strategy. Uh, prior to joining the Bush School, Dr. Castillo worked in the Department of Defense's Strategy and Plans Office. And before that, he was an analyst at the RAND Corporation, where he focused on military strategy, nuclear deterrence, and WMD terrorism. Prior to RAND, he was a consultant for, excuse me, the Institute for Defense Analyses. Dr. Castillo earned his PhD in political science from the University of Chicago, where he received research support from the National Science Foundation and the Smith Richardson Foundation. His many publications span topics like U.S. defense policy, military history, and nuclear deterrence. But tonight, we're going to focus a little bit more on his book, Endurance and War, the National Sources of Military Cohesion, and the Ongoing Russian Invasion of Ukraine. So, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Of course, our pleasure. So I guess I'll start off uh, just with uh, a question about your book. So in your book, you talk about four different types of militaries, which are messianic, authoritarian, professional, and apathetic. And you define uh, them by based on the, the degree of regime control over a population and the degree of autonomy the armed forces possess for training. So what types of militaries are we seeing in Ukraine and Russia right now? And what are their prospects for victory against one another? Well, I think morale and cohesion have been uh, variables that uh, are really important for any conflict. But in this conflict, I think they were discounted, especially on the Russian side. I think the Russians assumed in their strategy that all they had to do is show up, uh, go boo, and then the Ukrainians would, would surrender. I think they believed that the Ukrainian military would do their best France 1940 impression, but instead the Ukrainians are doing their best France 1914 impression. I think we have two professional militaries fighting each other. Uh, this is not the Soviet Union. This is a Russian military and a Russian state that is um, maybe not uh, the, the Totalitarian. I'm hesitant to use the word totalitarian because in political science it's loaded, but it's it's not the authoritarian system of Stalin. There is a civil society. There is resistance. Uh, it's it's a it, it lacks the police state and the terror apparatus that Stalin had, but more importantly, lacks the kind of ideology that Stalin could imbue in in the Red Army, which saved it in uh, 1941 during Operation Barbarossa. Um, so you have two professional militaries. Uh, that means if they're left alone to trade, if they train, if they focus on war fighting, then uh, they should be able to recover from defeats. Uh, they don't like long wars. Uh, think of the US in Vietnam. Um, what I think you're seeing is that the Ukrainians have been preparing. Uh, Crimea gave them a, a taste of what was to come. Uh, and I think they have an added bonus as they're defending their homeland. So they're not France 1940 apathetic. They're more like France 1914 professional. I think the Russians compounding their problems have a lot of conscripts who apparently don't know why they're there. So if we're reading some of the reporting in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, uh, there have been a lot of desertions. There's been a lot of units who um, refuse to fight when... Uh, when face force with setbacks. So that's how I would describe what's going on uh, in terms of their co military cohesion. So this makes sense too, right? Because if you're Ukraine, what you want to do for to defeat Russia is promise them that they're going to fight a grinding war of attrition. So it's for the Ukrainians, their theory of victory, I think is not uh, Hungary 1956 or Czechoslovakia 68, that's what the Russians want, or Georgia in 2008, that's what the Russians want. I think uh, Ukraine has to promise the Russians that the longer they stay, the more it looks like Afghanistan. Great. Well, you've already touched on uh, the next question that I wanted to ask you, which was that, you know, it appears that Russia's plan was to swoop in, quickly establish victory in Ukraine, and that they wanted to basically achieve a fait accompli. 
So why was that fait accompli a desirable outcome for Russia? You've, you've touched on it a little bit at the end of that answer, but say a little bit more about why Russia would want a fait accompli. When this war started, I thought it was trying to follow the Operation Iraqi Freedom Shock and All model, where um, the mere, it was going to be a quick coercive campaign. And um, in the most ideal case for Russia, just the mere presence of an invasion would cause the center of gravity of Ukraine to collapse. We know that the Ukrainian military is more resilient than that. So the second best option for this strategy would be some kind of blitzkrieg where surprise and then movement and then momentum would catch the Ukrainian military on their back heels. The Russians expected them to fight like they did in 2014. They expected a conventional defense against maneuver warfare. They expected Ukrainian forces to mount, which would make them vulnerable to uh, Russian long range fires, their cruise missiles, their artillery. Uh, instead, they look to be fighting in a more di dispersed fashion. Um, the Russian assumptions about the Ukrainian will to fight, that they wouldn't have a strong will to fight, played into how they fought. So you saw a lot of units just suddenly drive into Ukraine and maneuver units started to outrun their logistical support. Um, they compounded this with other mistakes like uh, not having dismounted infantry to protect the armor against any tank weapons. So that played right into Ukraine's strategy, which was, which seems to be um, using guerrilla warfare tactics are too strong, but they're, they're finding, fighting dismounted. They're fighting dispersed. They're using uh, man pads, man portable air defenses, and they're using any tank guided munitions to really inflict a lot of damage on the Russians. So remember, the Russians had surprise, speed, momentum as part of their theory of victory, but uh, they've handled it poorly. They're not using combined arms. Uh, the strategy looks very disjointed. They had poor command and control. Um, what else are they doing wrong? Strangely, they used all these cruise missiles to take down parts of the Ukrainian air defense, but then they didn't achieve air supremacy. So I, I'm, I'm struggling to figure out what it is they're trying to do. I do think that for the first three innings, the Ukrainians have been fighting really well, but it's a longer game. And uh, the Russians have a lot of equipment, a lot of forces. Uh, and I also think they have, they view that they have a lot at stake as well. So I think what's happening is that the Russians, are regrouping and they're gonna to try to do a coercive ground campaign in the same way we did a coercive air campaign in Kosovo 1999. So it's gonna look more like Georgia in 2008. I don't think the Russians want to swallow all of Ukraine. I think they wanna use a coercive ground campaign, maybe strip away some provinces where there are ethnic minorities that are sympathetic to Russia. But really this is about compelling and coercing the government to uh, adopt a stance of neutrality. That's that's my read of what's going on. But remember, we don't have really good information coming out of the battlefield. Yeah, those are all, all really great points. I wanna go back to focusing on the Ukrainian side for a second, because you've already mentioned that, you know, it doesn't seem like Russia wants to take over all of Ukraine. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to kind of think about that in terms of nationalism, because, you know, Amir Scheimer says that populations under existential threat are going to come together and fight back due to nationalism and that that means that uh, countries are harder to conquer. Um, so do you think that that's going to contribute to the overall effectiveness of the Ukrainian military? I do. Uh, I'm in, I'm a big believer in what Barry Posen called the cont contested zones, right? So allegedly the U.S. commands the commons, although I think that's that's for another conversation, but there's there's less of that today, but we're still pretty good in the comments. But the contested zone where the, was the interior part of people's homelands. And I think the lesson of the last 30 years is we don't do so well in the contested zone. And I think the Russians are even more sensitive to that because of their experience in Afghanistan. Um, I would be surprised if the Russians thought they're gonna just annex the entire country of Ukraine. They annex Crimea, they have a base there, there are populations there that are sympathetic to them. 
same in parts of eastern Ukraine, right? Because there is a civil war going on in Ukraine. But the further west you go, especially across the Dnepr River, I think you put yourself in the nationalism hornet's nest. Now, here's here's an interesting thing that I hear um, pro- professionals in our in our business, but also my students saying, which is, isn't it great that we can get Russia into this insurgency in Ukraine because then we can really bleed them white. We can impose cost on them. Uh, my retort is, the longer the, this war goes on, it's not very good for Ukrainians. And the longer this war goes on, which is next door to NATO, the more dangerous it is for us. So yes, it's the Ukrainians are very brave. Yes, I have moral outrage about what's going on. No, I'm not surprised that Russia invaded. Uh, it is a stupid strategy for Russia. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think because of nationalism, the Russians have to be very careful not to get stuck in an attrition warfare that bleeds them white, but it's not actually good for the rest of us if that happens too. Right, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I have my button, by the way, less war, more strategy. That's right, yeah, no, I'm so glad you brought that. (laughs) It's, yeah, that's, we're we're very proud of that slogan, so that's great. (laughs) Um, so, um, and it's you know, in Ukrainian speaking, colors. I'll point that out. It is, you know, we didn't plan that. I think when we picked the colors originally, but that, <laughs> that certainly is part of the discussion. That's great. Um, so I let's, let's go back to what you were saying about, you know, alleviating the suffering of Ukrainians. Cause I think that that is, that is makes uh, something that we, uh, you know, reasonable people can be concerned about. Um, and I'll, I think the most popular thing that we're hearing in DC right now is that folks are calling for a no fly zone. Um, so could you talk about what does a no-fly zone actually entail? Um, does it raise the risk of ex- escalation? And it is, is it a good idea? So uh, back in the Imperial capital, there's a discussion about no-fly zones, but also partial no-fly zones. And I think the first problem is you either have a no-fly zone or you don't. So I don't think there's such a thing. Problem two and this is before we even get to the dangers, we get to the mechanics of a no-fly zone. It's not clear to me that NATO has the airframes in the right bases to conduct a no-fly zone over Ukraine. It's not something that NATO really prepares to do. Um, So it would have to move a lot of planes closer by. It would probably have to move more airframes to Europe to do this kind of operation. So The best benchmark is if you go look at some of the RAND analysis about these war games where Russia takes over the Baltics, in those war games, if you assume that the same airframes you would need to eject the Russians from the Baltics are the same airframes you would need for a no-fly zone, there could be some variation, but just use it as a baseline. We're talking, you know, 10 to 15 squadrons of fighter planes and seven squadrons of bombers. So there is... You know, there is one, if you're going to do a no-fly zone, there's no such thing as partial. And two, it requires a heck of a lot of airplanes that we don't have there right now. So it's a question we, that we can actually do this promptly. And third problem are the risks. And this, to me, is the most compelling. Uh, you A no-fly zone means you're basically achieving air supremacy. I think this is what the Air Force calls it. They go back between supremacy and superiority. But you would achieve su- superiority or supremacy over Ukraine. And that means you would be able to um, suppress the Russian air defense and you would make sure that no Russian planes would fly, which means you would be destroying Russian uh, targets and killing Russian pilots. You would be engaged essentially in a conventional air campaign against Russia, uh, otherwise known as a war. And you would be having a conflict, engaged in a conflict with a nuclear armed power And in my view, there are three things you wanna be concerned about in that kind of conflict. One is you wanna worry about their incentive to deliberately use nuclear weapons. So there's this debate about what is Russian military strategy and it has special Russian characteristics called escalate to de-escalate. And lo and behold, if you hit shift F7 and you get a synonym for escalate to de-escalate, you get flexible response, which was our strategy during the Cold War. In other words, I'm losing conventionally, so I'm going to reach for nuclear weapons. I'm going to gradually escalate until you stop. 
So there's the risk of deliberate escalation. A second risk is inadvertent escalation. This is the, the problem that Barry Posen made famous in his book right at the end of the Cold War. Great idea, bad timing, but the argument was the way the US likes to fight by ripping down air defenses, attacking command and control with our conventional forces. It could look like a conventional attack on the other side's nuclear forces. And it's hard to discern, right? Because there's a lot of confusion, there's the fog of war. So, you know, the Russians would have to decide whether the conventional ordnance landing at an air base is uh, meant to attack the nuclear forces there, or is it just part of the conventional war? And then the third problem that you face when you're fighting a nuclear armed power, this is the third risk, is accidental escalation. So if we take seriously Russian concerns about strategic stability, which is again, a synonym for, we are worried that you might decapitate us or strike us first in a crisis, they raise these concerns an awful lot. They're worried about our precision guided munitions and our missile defenses acting in coordination conjunction to uh, attack their nuclear forces. If you're worried about that as the Russians, then maybe you lessen the command and control over those, those weapons so you can ensure that you could use them without being decapitated. In other words, you're unlocking them. Well, in that scenario, you're raising the probability of accidents. So if we if I go back to my shelf here and take bring down Scott Sagan's book, The Limits of Safety, that's an excellent study that says even in peacetime, the Mercedes-Benz of, of nuclear weapons programs, which is our program, had somewhere between 60 to 80 accidents. And that's in peacetime. So imagine a program that is not as good and has the stress of wartime. That's very scary to me. This is why I do not want to have a no-fly zone. I want to be very clear about something. I don't think day one of the no-fly zone or the air war causes nuclear escalation. Instead, I think the war goes on. I just don't think a war ends with a no-fly zone. And if NATO wins that war against Russian maneuver units, our reward will be deliberate escalation while we're worrying about inadvertent and accidental. Right, I, and that actually gets to uh, uh, one of the questions that I was gonna ask you, but you kind of already answered it, that you know, so many, uh, you know, we might wanna think about, you know, under what conditions do we think Putin might actually want to use nuclear weapons? But what you're saying is that it might not be Putin. It might be somebody who's been delegated response down the line and how do we handle that? But also, you know, um, when we talk about uh, theories like uh, the nuclear taboo that maybe we would nobody wants to use nuclear weapons for 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 you know a variety of reasons. But uh, you know again when we're thinking about actually being in war, actually being uh, you know prone to the fog of war, there's a lot more uh, complications that we have to think about. Um, I do want to remind the audience too that uh, you can submit questions for Dr. Castillo using that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And you can also upvote other folks' questions if somebody else has already asked a question that you would like to hear from. But I'm going to ask one more of my own questions before we turn to questions from the audience. I just want um, to go back to the nuclear escalation oh, thing please, for, yeah. for a minute, because I can hear the, the clever briefer response to my concerns about deliberate, inadvertent, accidental escalation. There are some people who would respond to me by saying, well, the Russian command and control is pretty centralized, so it's hard to imagine them relaxing the command and control. Um, okay, maybe, but you still have the inadvertent escalation problem. And um, I think the, the broader question is, what's at stake that we would wanna take the risk of having a nuclear exchange with Russia? I mean, that's, People have been recently criticizing the nuclear revolution, like there's no such thing. And, and, and I am sympathetic to a lot of those arguments. The nuclear revolution is imperfect, but I will remind people that the nuclear revolution correlates with no great power war. Uh, that could be for a variety of reasons, but I still think nuclear weapons, if they land on you will hurt. And that should focus the mind about what's worth fighting and dying for. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad that you you took the time to respond to that too. Um, I'm going to switch over to questions from the audience for a little bit. The, the yeah. first question that we have is from Thomas Vien. Uh, and he asks, uh, there are news reports suggesting that many Taiwanese have been shaken in some of their complacency about the threat of invasion after seeing what's happening in Ukraine. 
And now they're considering how to build the foundations of civil resistance and a more resilient military. How long does it take to shift boxes in your model of military resilience? And are there any mistakes and pitfalls to avoid in that process? Well, I haven't thought about that uh, question. That's a tough one. Most in in my book, uh, I'm trying to think of countries that shifted. So if you look at the World War I, I combatants, the French go from professional to apathetic. The Russians go from professional to authoritarian because of the Russian Revolution and uh, good old Stalin. Uh, and then the Germans go from uh, professional to messianic. How long did those transformations take? You know, it's hard to say, maybe a few decades. I have to think longer about that. Uh, and, and what was his other part of his question? Uh, the other part of the question was that, are there any mistakes or pitfalls to avoid in the process, which? Well, I think that the it's less about, it's always been an open question to me about whether or not the Taiwanese would fight when the Chinese amphibious assault comes. And I always ask my China watchers the answer to this question and they dodge it by focusing on tactics, techniques, or technology, um, which is not is interesting to me. But it could be that this has been a jarring experience for them and that you know defending your homeland is something you need to really think about. Um, I would think that the Chinese behavior in Hong Kong and in uh, against the Uyghurs would be motivation to uh, want to defend yourself uh, in, during the Chinese amphibious assault. So I'm not sure it's a matter of resilience or morale or cohesion. I think it's a matter of, are they buying the right weapon systems? And do they have a strategy to deal with the amphibious assault uh, in a way that would coordinate with the US Navy. Uh, by the way, I'm not sure, you know, much to Texas chagrin, I'm not sure I would defend Taiwan, but that's not my decision. Um, and nor do I think that the Taiwanese should rely on the Americans to defend them. The one lesson you could draw here is make sure that you're really hard to conquer. Make sure when the amphibious assault comes, you're promising the Chinese a long grinding war of attrition. Great. Well, we'll take another question from the audience. And the next one is actually from uh, Eric Gomez. Uh, he asks, um, so realism and restraints arguments against NATO expansion were typically undergirded by assumptions such as, you know, a lack of NATO unity, unwillingness of European allies to burden share, and the risk of conflict with Russia. So does the Ukraine conflict challenge any of these assumptions? So for example, you know, is that the military, the Russian military is not as effective as we thought, unity and burden sharing might actually be increasing in NATO. Um, and he tacks on an additional question too. So if that is the case, is there a lower risk of NATO expansion uh, to places like Sweden uh, or Finland? I'm not sure. Uh, I can tell you what I would prefer is no more NATO expansion and a neutral Ukraine and some kind of arms control agreement with the Russians about how far east NATO conventional forces can go and how many conventional forces uh, Russia can deploy on their western borders. Uh, it's, you know, as a member of the realist restraint community, my objection to NATO expansion had less to do with the Russian military and more to do with, I just didn't think that it is in our core interest to expand NATO. Um, I could see some logic to the 1999 expansion. Uh, Schifferinson has helped me get to that point, but um, defending at some point, we had to think about what it'd be like to defend some of these places. So this morning I gave a briefing uh, to the German general staff on conventional deterrence. And I told them that the biggest danger they have against the Russian military is not this huge ground offensive that they seem to be flailing around in, in Ukraine, but rather uh, small uh, smash and grab operations like Crimea. So not swaddling all the three Baltic states at once, but attacking 
areas where there are Russian minorities and doing it in a fait accompli, that's really hard for NATO. You know, they're not, to defend against that, you need to have a forward defense. Well, NATO does not have a forward defense. It has a mobile defense, right? It has the, the very ready joint task force, which is a horrible acronym. It has some trip wires in Poland and the Baltic states, uh, but it's, it's quite small, right? Um, it's not like the forward defense we had in Europe, but if you're legitimately concerned or you need some kind of planning metric for NATO to worry about Eastern Europe, then you probably want to have some kind of forward defense. But that's a forward defense that is from the Baltics all the way down to the Black Sea. And that's, that's one other reason I didn't want to expand NATO. It's really, really hard uh, to defend. Right. Well, and if I could interject a little bit, too, I think one of the questions that I've gotten recently is, um, could you make a realist case to ask, you know, places like Sweden or Finland to join just to show the other countries in NATO how to have an effective military? Um, which uh, I think my response to it was, why, well, why does it have to be NATO? Why does it have? Because, like you said, um, you know, a lot of these, uh, the, the, the unique thing about NATO is that the U.S. is committed to defending the countries within it. So, you know, it, it seems to me that the better response would be to say, well, why can't there be more European cooperation to instead of doing it through NATO? Would that fit with kind of the response that you're saying? I would like to pass the torch to the Europeans to defend themselves in Europe because Russia is not the Soviet Union in 1983. Um, it is a revanchist power because I think uh, it has some legitimate security concerns. It stupidly launched a war in Ukraine. But as I told the Germans this morning, it's time for you folks to step up and, and, and do some of the defense. And adding more members to NATO does not excite me because I don't want to create more commitments to the United States. I see the rise of China as a potential problem down the road. I agree with my disagree with my dissertation advisor about China's military threat today, but I can see the trends and I can see a good argument that we should keep our powder dry and you know, get our act together at home and prepare for a potentially very dangerous security competition with China. I don't wanna make it premature. I don't wanna make it self-fulfilling prophecy, but I think this Russian problem in Ukraine is kind of a dangerous distraction to American grand strategy. Well, that flows really nicely into a question that we have from uh, someone who wishes to remain anonymous. Uh, and they ask, do you think the U.S. is willing to engage in direct involvement in the event that it starts to look like Ukraine will be lost to Russia? And my guess is that your answer is no, but I'll, I'll let you uh, further explain. No, I, I think uh, I'm very glad that President Biden does not have an appetite for getting involved in this conflict. I think the dangers are just too high. Rightly or wrongly, I think the Russians view it like their Cuban Missile Crisis. It's interesting, before this, before this war started, there was a debate about whether or not we lived in a 21st century world that had no spheres of influence versus a 19th century world where there were spheres of influence. Well, I think we've answered that question. There are spheres of influence. At least Russia thinks there are, and Russia's willing, willing to fight for them. And they've telegraphed that. So no. Stay out. But but the longer this war gets on, I worry. Great. Well, I think uh, Ryan Bearcaw has a has a question that follows on to that, too, which is, you know, if the U.S. is not going to get involved and we think that that's a good thing, is Ukraine equipped to to launch anything, uh, any type of counteroffensive to retake key pieces of of Ukraine? So. Um, and he mentions that he worries that this is going to become increasingly relevant as Russians maneuver around Kiev. What do you think? I think Ryan's right. I think the embedded is his question is the answer, which is they're doing a pretty good job of defending themselves against a terrible blitzkrieg, against a Russia not following its own doctrine, and against a Russia making mistakes. Um, I'm not sure the Ukrainians have the armored forces and the mobility to uh, retake. You know, it's not like it's not like those battles we had, those battles we studied in class on the Eastern Front during World War II, where both sides had armor and they would maneuver and they would seesaw back and forth. 
it looks like the Ukrainians are really good at standing and fighting and holding their ground. Retaking it, I think, is another matter. Right. So I have another question from Elizabeth Pearl Morgan, who says, John Mearsheimer blames the Russo-Ukraine crisis on the West. Um, I believe that she's referring to his 2014 article, um, which yeah. that's basically what the title is. Which the uh, Russian so in- site. Pardon? Which the Russian <laughs> site. <laughs> So in your view, um, what are some legitimate problems with NATO or the democratic rush that Russia has identified um, as as an agitation? And I I think one more, another different way that we could ask that would be, you know, is NATO expansion part of the problem here? Um, Because I I think that it's it's probably going too far to say that NATO expansion is the only issue that or the only reason that that Russia invaded Ukraine there. But, um, you know, uh, what how what's what's the role of NATO expansion in that? Well, I'm a believer that when we look at the causes of war, that we separate out the deep causes from the proximate causes. And uh, as as a a devotee of realist theories of international politics, um, I think realism is good at explaining some of the deep causes of this conflict, but I don't think it could explain Putin's decision to launch a war um, because there are a lot of it's, I think it is a leap to say that the war is caused by NATO expansion because um, the war might cause NATO expansion. The war is dangerous for Putin. The war is costly for Putin. There are other ways Putin could have prevented NATO expansion. Nor do I think NATO expansion is the only deep cause. I think the expansion of the EU is seen as kind of a creeping NATO expansion. I also think the colored revolutions uh, were a threat to Putin's regime. That's not a very realist answer, by the way. But those three things, I think, were a big driver is motivating uh, Russian desires to change the status quo. The status quo was intolerable. But I want to be clear, and, and Schifferson has convinced me of this, that, that there are two revisionist sides in Europe. NATO and the United States, since the end of the Cold War, pushing expansion because they thought they could and there wouldn't be any cost to it. I mean, I remember talking to some of my colleagues down the hall here at AM where I would say, Aren't you worried that you're going to poke the bear? And at some point, you're going to poke the bear in a place that's hard to defend. And oh, no, the Russians won't do that because it's illegal. And they know that the conquest doesn't pay anymore. And well, mm-hmm. on the other side, you have a Russia that's revisionist, right? And, and the NATO expansion, this doesn't get enough uh, uh, consideration. NATO expansion plays into Putin's Putinism, right? The nationalism that props him up, the, the grievance politics, uh, the desire of Russia to be seen and treated as a great power. So you have these like two revisionist powers that were on a, on a collision course, but it is too strong to say that uh, expansion caused war, expansion caused tension, expansion caused revisionism. But the decision to go to war and the moral opprobrium associated with that goes to Putin. That was his dumb, uh, dumb decision in my view. Did I answer the question? I think so, yeah. <laughs> um, so I actually have two questions here from Joel Blankenship, but I'm just gonna ask one uh, for now. So. Uh, he asked, why do you think the Russian ground forces aren't fighting in battalion tactical groups as they've conceptually been doing in exercises like Zapad and other extensive live fire trainings? Um, he says that there's been an immense lack of tactical combined arms and integration, especially in terms of how the DOD and the IC has conceptualized the Russian military. So do you think this goes beyond a lack of planning and reveal larger issues? Well, that was the I- first question, yeah. I have two hypotheses about this. Number one, it could be driven by bad strategy. It could have been, we're exercising and now we're gonna invade Ukraine and tell the troops we're gonna invade Ukraine and drive in this particular direction. And we think the Ukrainian resistance will be minimal. Uh, this, our mere presence, the taking down the air defense will cause shock and awe. So maybe the bad strategy means you don't follow the doctrine. The other, uh, explanation is uh, threat inflation, that we assume that by watching these exercises, these units were 10 feet tall and they would actually follow the doctrine. 
And it turns out that there's more variability in skill across the Russian military than we initially thought. And that what we're seeing, especially near Kiev, which is getting a lot of the um, media attention, are units that aren't following uh, their doctrine. I'm, I'm shocked. I'm shocked by um, using standoff weapons like cruise missiles to take down the air defense, but then not sealing the deal by flying the Russian Air Force to piecemeal destroy the Ukrainian Air Force. And then at the same time, doing things like aerial assaults <laughs> when the Ukrainian air defense is still up. Uh, that's confused me. It's, it's confused me that, um, as Joel pointed out, you have maneuver units that are getting out in front of their logistical support, but those maneuver units also don't have dismounted infantry to protect them against anti-tank weapons, right? By the way, this is not only a Russian mistake. The, Israelis had this problem in 2006 against Hezbollah. Israelis again in 73 uh, in the Yom Kippur War. Um, so, but in the Russian case, I just think maybe they bought a lot of equipment, but practice makes perfect and maybe they're not practicing enough. I had a, an officer in one of my classes today say, you know, the stories about vehicles breaking down and the, the tires in some of these vehicles, he says, you don't understand that when you're in a in a uh, an armored BTC that maintenance, 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 maintenance is the key to keep things moving. I also saw an interesting piece that said that the Russians, when they were flushed with oil money, decided to make their battalion tactical groups much heavier. But by making them heavier, they didn't also come up with the uh, complementary logistics to support heavier BTGs. And so that's why you're seeing them slow down and get stuck in traffic. And then finally, I would say to Joel, um, not only are there are variations in skill, but there could be variations in will where conscripts are just, they're encountering the first resistance and they're like, whoa, we didn't sign up for this. But all this, I will say with lots of uncertainty because I'm telling you what I'm piecing together from the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the New York Times, BBC. Oh, and France 24. That's my go-to these days. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and ask Joel's second question, too, uh, which is, oh, <laughs> so, um, uh, is he, he wanted to know about, you know, the supply chain destruction and the sanctions that have put and put on Russia. You know, do you think that, you know, given how how harsh those have been, um, do you think the Kremlin will seek a stop to operations at some point to save the larger strategic capability given their uh, relative lack of an industrial base? I'm going to punt on the sanction questions. I just don't feel comfortable. I know that's pr it's not fashionable on Twitter or for people who are in my field to punt on questions, but I, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. So maybe that's expertise. I'll have to ask Tom Nichols. That's totally fine. We have plenty of other questions. Um, and the next one is from John Mueller. Um, uh -oh. so, so he asked, uh, do you see a settlement in, Ukraine, in which Ukraine accepts some form of neutrality like Austria in the 1950s, uh, particularly since it seems unlikely to be admitted to NATO anytime soon? Uh, John, I think this is uh, an excellent question. And I think that is the path we're going to. Um, and I think it's kind of a tragedy because we could have gotten to this path without war, uh, had both sides been willing to, to talk more clearly and dampen down their revisionism. Um, I think there are several models you could use, like Austria, um, the Finland model during the Cold War. Uh, there may be other models uh, from previous eras. Uh, if I had to go and negotiate it now, I would talk about how it, the Ukraine could be in the EU, but not in NATO. And then I would I would make some kind of a conventional forces in Europe treaty, like we had at the end of the Cold War, that said there are certain parts of the world or parts of Eastern Europe where you can't have large forward deployed conventional forces or, or nuclear forces. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is if you go back to this discussions about the START treaty and renewal of, of START, the Russians were very worried that once the INF Treaty went away, that we would put Pershing twos back in Europe. 
And you remember those are medium range. Uh, they have like 3000 kilometer range ballistic missiles. And I think the Pershing twos had three warheads on them. Uh, I think I read somewhere that Gorbachev used to say that he felt like those were guns to his head. I mean, these weapons can reach their targets in, in Russia, flying from Germany in you know five to 10 minutes. So uh, there are good strategic stability reasons to not only uh, have some kind of settlement where Ukraine is militarily neutral, but arms control agreements that separate out forces and uh, deal with some of Russia's security concerns, which are not just conventional forces, but nuclear force. Great, and uh, we have another question here from John Wilkie, and he uh, he starts with a quotation from Evan Montgomery, who I know you hosted recently yes. at the Albertan Center in a discussion with Eugene Goltz. Um, but he he has this quote from Evan Montgomery, who, which uh, is he attributes to his Ukrainian American mother. She used to say that if you put two Ukrainians in a room, they'll form three political parties, but if you threaten them, they become one family. Yeah. Um, so I hadn't heard that before, but well, we'll I'll have to we'll have to hear that from Evan, I guess. That was how he um, tweeted that the other day. Oh, but I'm not on Twitter. So oh, okay. <laughs> all right, well, I'll take a look later then. But, you know, uh, John Wilkie wants to know then, um, you know, given that uh, that we have seen this saying manifest itself in the current conflict, um, you know, what are your thoughts on uh, future analysis of the a potential civil resistance building up? And uh, what might that mean for military effectiveness in Ukraine? Um, so yeah, his, his concern is, is how hard would the Ukrainians fight if they're defeated conventionally? Would they conduct kind of a partisan war or, or an insurgency? Yes, that, I, I think that's his question. He has a couple other questions here too. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll stick with that one. I think he's asking about, you know, how, how does that, what does that look like? Well, again, I think we go back to the Eastern Front in World War II and remember the, that um, Soviet uh, partisans conducted a campaign against the Wehrmacht, which was really enervating to German forces as they were trying to defend in Eastern Europe. It made the occupation of Eastern Europe really painful. Um, I can see a scenario where Let's assume the Russians want to take large parts of Ukraine, which I don't think they do. I mean, they're mounting a big operation, but I think this is a punishment campaign. It's a uh, what some people might call a um, uh, a punitive campaign. But let's say they wanted to take part or all of Ukraine. I mean, I, I think they would be facing an insurgency that they're not capable of dealing with. Uh, it's an insurgent. I mean. We could even tell ourselves a story about how in Iraq we would win hearts and minds as long as we could achieve population security. But Ukraine's very big, and is can the Russian military, using the metrics that are in FM three twenty four revised redition, uh, I I don't think the Ukrainians or the Russians have enough forces to really occupy the place, right? So they would be vulnerable in that respect. And the second vulnerability they have is that the Russian people aren't that excited about this war, especially in combination with sanctions. And the third thing that's pressing down on them is the memory of Afghanistan. I'm old enough to remember uh, Gorbachev being bothered by coffins of Russian, Russian soldiers coming back from Afghanistan. So I'm not saying that bin Laden defeated the Soviet Union and caused the collapse of the Soviet Union, but they're a professional force. Professional forces, are cohesive if you tell them that the objective is X and they will take casualties to make that objective. If the objective is amorphous and unclear and takes forever, then you're gonna break their will to fight, especially in a conscript army. The key for us in Iraq and Afghanistan recently is that it's been a professional non-conscript army, which was a big difference in Vietnam. Right. Well, and that actually ties really nicely into this next question that I have, which is uh, D.E. Lee asks, um, basically, what is the impact of uh, civil military relations in Russia on the military's effectiveness? So this is getting straight back into your book. You know, yeah. what what does that what does that look like? You know, so I think like a lot of us my interest in the Russian military has been focusing prior to this war on their exercises, right? Zapad 9 and 
kavkas and all these different exercises. And I'm looking at the equipment they're buying and I'm looking at how these BTGs are heavier than uh, American uh, mechanized infantry battalions. And I'm worried about the American military handing out frozen chickens in Iraq and Afghanistan while the Russians are getting, you know, going to school on conventional war. And I kind of get lulled into the Rand war games and thinking, wow, these Russians are really tough and they're using their oil money very wisely. But since the war has been happening, the more and more I read about uh, things going inside the Russian military as an organization, the more I think they have a lot of problems. So I read about corruption, that um, yes, they're buying lots of equipment, but there are also people who are generals who are profiting from a lot of these purchases. Um, There's a lot of graft. Um, I'm reading about how there are um, real tensions between units that are elite because they're professional and contract versus ones that are conscript where the former get better training than the latter. I'm reading about how when they go to fight and exercise that there's really tight command and control. Now that probably is not a surprise because that was a problem with the Soviet military that uh, we knew there wasn't much in terms of initiative Uh, and adaptation at lower levels. I don't want people to think I'm making a cultural argument that is like, oh, well, this is how Russians fight. And what they do is they overwhelm the enemy with lots of numbers. That's not what I'm saying. There are periods where they fight like that. And there are periods where they're better at Blitzkrieg than the Wehrmacht. So go and look at um, House and Glance when Titans Clash. That's a really good book that shows variation and how the Soviets performed in World War II. But um, there may be deeper civil military issues that we don't have visibility on, which is I don't know what the relationship is between the regime, Putin, and the oligarchs. I don't know what's going on in that triangle. I know that some, I saw someone in the New York Times say, well, we'll put all these sanctions on, it'll make the, the Russian people cry uncle, and then the military will coo and get rid of Putin. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure that's the pathway. I don't. When people talk about coups in Russia, I, I worry that that's sort of a hail mary on on the part of some analysts. Great. Well, I have uh, a question from Marion Foster. Uh, who asked if you can just say a little bit more about Russian advances in the south of Ukraine. I think a lot of what we've talked about so far has been about the northern invasion, um, which is you know, more around Kiev. Um, so she, uh, they ask, what could be the strategic goal for Russia in, in the south and possible effects on security in the Black Sea region? Yeah, so I think that it looks like to me that they are trying to make Ukraine landlock and build a uh, land bridge to Moldova. Um, if you ask me if there is a potential next target for Putin in Russia, it might be Moldova. Um, the, there is more progress in the South, but there's been less attention in the South. Um, from what I've read, um, there's real progress in the South and the East. Those are the um, provinces that Putin declared independent or autonomous. Um, in some of the reporting, there's talk about an amphibious assault in the next few days against Odessa. But overall, I think they're trying to cut the Ukrainians off from the Black Sea. This could be permanent, or this could be part of a coercive strategy to inflict pain on Ukraine to get them to make concessions. You, you want to remember that Zelensky said today, like, well, you know, on second thought, neutrality might not be such a bad idea. And that's that is a evidence, I think, of the uh, Russian coercive campaign uh, having some effect. And that should be rational. Great. So uh, next question is from Jan Gerber, uh, who asks, uh, do you expect Russian forces to start fighting in a com- combined arms way? So, you know, protecting their armor with infantry, using their air force more effectively, et cetera. But also, do you think the Ukrainians will adapt from their di- dispersed style of fighting? So basically, what's what, I, what kind of outcome do you expect in the next couple of weeks? I expect the Russians to return to form. I expect them to uh, 
maybe baseball analogies are bad, but you know, the Russian pitchers had three bad innings and he stepped off the mound and he's rubbing up the baseball and slowing down the pace of the game because things are not going well. So I think they should return to form. That's going to, that's going to make the, the Ukrainian strategy of this kind of dispersed defense, these guerrilla warfare tactics harder uh, for Ukraine. It's better to be in a world where, they're having, they're using this kind of dispersed defense and the Russians are campaigning with bad combined arms and bad blitzkrieg. Should the Russians return to form, um, I think the Ukrainians will find it more difficult. Uh, there has been talk in the press that what the Russians want to do is level all the cities in Ukraine. I'm not sure that's their strategy because uh, if it is, it's reprehensible, and I'm not sure they have to do it in order to coerce. So at the outset of this campaign, I thought one of the one of the objectives was for the Russian military to smash the Ukrainian military, because then you could have this shadow overhanging Ukraine that says, you misbehave, I'll come back in here, right? That, I think that was quite effective with the Georgians. Do you remember in 2008 when John McCain said we're all Georgians now? And that was, again, that was a flirtation with NATO and the Russians said, mm, you know, we're, we're not that excited about this. And remember, the Russian performance wasn't that great in 2008 either, but I do think the message was sent and received. All right, next question is from Dan Tolstoy. He says uh, last week there was uh, the risk of an explosion at a nuclear power plant in Ukraine uh, because there was a military conflict between the troops and so there were there was a uh, live fire around the plant territory. So he asks, uh, what happens if uh, if there were a, a, an explosion at a nuclear power plant uh, in in that in the in that type of accident? Um, I guess I would tack on: Do we know what would happen, or are do are we just in a world of unknowns at that point? Mm, this is why I wish one of my colleagues from nuclear engineering was available to answer because they love these kinds of questions. And my eyes usually glaze over during these briefings, uh, which is bad because now it's really relevant. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm more worried. Well, it's not good whenever you have fighting near a nuclear power plant. But of, of, of equal concern is the reporting that you have people uh, working in these plants who are not allowed to who are living under bad conditions, bad and stressful conditions. So I think both of those things are a problem, but uh, my apologies to Jan, I, I don't have a good answer to that question. I'm a political scientist, not a scientist. Well, I guess it, maybe we could reframe it in political science terms then, you know, is there you know, a greater risk of nuclear escalation uh, if, if there is a, a nuclear power plant explosion? I mean, if it's, it's an no, accident, right? So. so, okay, all right, great. So we'll move on to the next question then. So um, uh, Evan, uh, and I, I don't believe it's Evan Montgomery because he lists his initials as LD, but a different Evan asks, um, how do we resolve this crisis diplomatically without falling into some form of appeasement? Um, you know, he says that every, it's reasonable to say that every diplomatic action should be taken, but, you know, given the way that Putin is acting, uh, what does he have to do for Europe to say this is too much? Well, I say two things. Number one, not everything is Munich 1938. Um, you know, if you have kind of a 19th century realist view that like I have, then um, great powers behave badly because they can. And uh, we can bemoan it, we can be upset about it, but it is what it is. And so the real choice is, do you want the conflict to linger on or do you wanna make some concessions? And it seems to me that all three sides are gonna to have to make some kind of concession. And before this conflict, it was, it was a strange combination of, we're not gonna put Ukraine in NATO, but we have every right to do so if we want to. And the Russians saying, absolutely not. Um, I don't see that as appeasement. Um, I think, well, let, me put it, let me rephrase it. It's accommodating a great power that has more at stake. And even in the Munich example, I'm not sure Britain and France are ready to fight for the Sudetenland 
in 1938. And I think that increasingly historians have come to that conclusion. So that's just not me walking out on a plank. And so, but but let's let's take it further. Let's say it is appeasement. It stops the war in Ukraine. The downside would be that you're wetting Putin's appetite. But as a good realist, I believe the system corrects and people are balancing. Right? The Germans have their dander up. Uh, the Europeans are paying attention. And maybe it's okay to appease a great power that's military is not that great. Cost would be lower, right? Yeah, that's an interesting thought experiment. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought up some of these European counterbalancing moves too, because we also have a question from Dan McVicker. Uh, he asks, um, how do you view Europe's energy security in the short term and medium term? Can the EU wean itself off of Russian gas in particular, which you know is maybe not um, the balancing in terms of military capabilities, but has certainly been a big topic uh, of interest in Washington. Yeah, um, well, look, high oil prices is, are good for my the equity in my house in Houston. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't plan to go any, on any road trips anytime soon. Uh, but in the short and medium term, I really have no idea. I'm not an oil and gas person. Um, you know, I've heard both sides of this argument about how uh, the more interdependent the Europeans are with Russia, the more vulnerable they are to coercion. Maybe, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't really have a, a direct answer to that. Uh, I guess if I were Germany, I probably wouldn't want to be highly dependent on Russia if I thought that Russia was a bad actor. So maybe this has finally convinced them that Russia maybe is a bad actor. And maybe you don't want to be dependent on bad actors. But the, I think the the, the trade offs are more nuanced than I can uh, than I can really describe. All right. Well, um, it looks like we only have about two more minutes left, so I'm going to ask one more oh, question before that went we fast. close. I know, I thought so too. Um, I do want to remind all of our uh, participants who are listening that the John Quincy Adams Society's uh, Student Foreign Policy Essay Contest is closing soon on March 20th. So I highly recommend that you take a look at that. Um, but our last question, we'll go back to John Mueller. Uh, he asks, what role do you think corruption in the military played in Russia's invasion of Ukraine, since we talked a bit about that earlier? Uh, but also, you know, should the Chinese be worried about that if they try to take Taiwan? So I'll let you let you close us out with, with uh, Dr. Yeah. Mueller's question. So the question is, what role did corruption play? Right. Yeah. So he, I, I think he's asking from that civil military pers oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, perspective in Russia, did, did corruption play a role? But also, um, is that something that might play out in, in a Chinese invasion of Taiwan as well? Yeah. One of my favorite books in our discipline is Jack Snyder's uh, Myths of Empire. Uh, and you know, my advisor would say, well, you know, you, you like arguments that are too complicated. But one of the takeaways is that you have these, you, you have regimes that are neither just strictly democratic or strictly authoritarian. You have these constellations of interests in countries and that are oligarchical to use Snyder's term. And Russia looks a lot like that. And so does China and so does Iran. And if you believe Snyder's argument, then these countries have terrible evaluative capabilities. So we would suspect that the civilians in the military, like in Wilhelmine, Germany, aren't having really honest, uh, open communications or discussions about war plans. And it could be that the Russian military said, you know, we've been making all these investments and practicing and we're ready to go. Uh, and it could have been based on misperceptions about Ukrainian will to fight, but also just having terrible insight to how good the military is, especially if you have a, a military that's highly central, centralized and rewards people who are yes men, as opposed to people who cause problems. So yeah, I think it's deep, it, it's, a, it's one part civil military because you have this constellation of interests that are terrible at evaluating foreign and defense policy. And then it could be a problem within the military where they promote people who don't rock the boat. And, you know, 
I don't study the Chinese military, uh, but I can imagine that being a problem as well. You know, Taylor Fravel's written a book called Active Defense, where he talks about how they're trying to professionalize and professional militaries ideally are open and honest about their problems that they have. But one can imagine that if civil military relations are bad, if the organization is highly uh, centralized and afraid of criticizing their leaders, then they're going to make they're going to suffer from miscalculations and misperception. Great. Well, with that, we are all out of time. Uh, thank you so much to Dr. Castillo for joining us and for uh, giving such great answers to uh, lots of different questions. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Uh, we will be back uh, same time, same place next week with uh, Lyle Goldstein. Uh, oh. and, and then next two weeks from that, we'll be uh, here with uh, Dr. David Arsenault, who is a Bush School alum, where Dr. Castillo is. One of my students. Excellent. Yes. Well, uh, John Gay, better worry. You're, you could be taking his job. <laughs> I, don't think so. I think it's more just there's so many good Bush School students and we're, we're really proud of that. But, uh, but again, thank you so much for, for being here and uh, good night and good health to everybody. Thank you. And I appreciate the questions. Oh, there's Ethan Kessler. That's interesting. And thanks to John Mueller for not asking questions that were too hard. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.